Hello everyone, I'm going to be making a series of podcasts summarizing the textbook Hacking the Art of Exploitation by John Erickson, uh, the second edition. Uh, this is a bit of an older textbook now, it's approaching about 10 years of age, but nonetheless it is a textbook which has stood the test of time and is very popular uh, even today. A lot of these notes um, are based on my personal reading of this textbook and the notes that I have taken while reading this textbook. So I guess I'll uh, get straight into it with uh, chapter 0 by 100, the introduction. Hacking isn't really about hooded criminals sitting in basements with high-tech equipment around them, and it isn't necessarily a criminal activity. In fact, it's more about following the law rather than breaking it. Hacking involves following the rules of an existing system, but using those rules in counterintuitive ways. So I'm going to give you an example of that, and this is a problem that you can solve on your own. So using the numbers 1, 3, 4, and 6, try and get the number 24 by using the four basic maths operations of plus, minus, addition, and subtraction. And I will reveal the answer at the end of this podcast. Hacking has its origins in the late 1950s. And um, there was this um, model railroad club, the MIT Model Railroad Club, which was given a donation of mostly old telephone equipment. And using this technology, the members created a complex system that allowed multiple operators to control different parts of the track by dialing in the appropriate sections. So no, there was no actual hacking sort of going on here. It was just using existing technology in uh, unconventional ways. And this is sort of considered the, the birthplace or the beginnings of hacking. So hacking as an art form has its origins starting out as an informal subculture that remained intensely focused on learning and mastering their art. And the core belief here was that information should be free to everyone. Uh, during this time, uh, in its early stages, there was also this uh, development of this thing called the hacker ethic. Basically, knowledge-driven values and an appreciation of logic uh, as an art form. So yeah, that's chapter one uh, in a nutshell, basically. Uh, it's really interesting reading up on this, actually. Hacking isn't necessarily a criminal activity. It kind of started off as as, as, as a way of, of doing good. It's also about not breaking the rules, but sort of reinventing the rules or following them, but in, in different ways, in unexpected ways. So I guess it has its sort of origins and grounding in experimentation, trying new things. Chapter 0 by 200, Programming. So yeah, as I kind of spoke about earlier, hacking and programming uh, doesn't really break the rules. It's just using the existing rules and frameworks in uh, new and inventive ways. An interesting point here was that um, in the business world, more importance is placed on making functional code rather than code which is optimized, uh, efficient, or elegant. So it doesn't really make sense to put tons of money and resources for diminishing gains. And that's why with a lot of business level software, you, there's so many exploits and so many problems with the code. It's because they've sort of made a trade-off between how much money they're spending and how good the actual code comes out. So the rest of this chapter is actually quite introductory and a lot of the content is sort of basic programming knowledge. So I'm just going to go over it a little bit quicker. What is programming? It's basically a set of instructions or steps written in a specific language. Pseudocode. Well, it's basically code, but in more understandable English. But it isn't really readable by computers. It's just something for humans to read and, and to write for other humans to read. Control structures. So these are quite basic concepts. So you've got your if, then, else structure. If a condition holds true, do this. If not, do something else. You've got while or until loops. So while a condition is true, do something. You've got for loops as well. So here you can specify a limit to how many times this loop is completed. A variable is an object with data that can be changed, or it can also be a constant. Uh, you've also got your uh, basic arithmetic operations. On top of that, you also have comparison operators. Uh, then you've got functions, which basically groups a set of instructions under one label. If you've got a lot of operations you want to do repeatedly, it's better to sort of combine them under, under one name. And that should be the end of that, the elementary control structures used in programming. So here we have our first C program, 
that we are going to be looking at in this textbook. Basically, it is a very simple program. There is a for loop and it prints hello world out 10 times. It is a very innocuous looking piece of code. However, we are going to be dissecting everything that happens behind the scenes. An interesting point made here is that a lot of programmers learn the language from the top down and never sort of see the bigger picture. And the way hackers sort of get their advantage, the way they get their edge is sort of from knowing how all the pieces interact within the bigger picture. So as long as the compiled program works, the average programmer is only really concerned with the source code. But a hacker realizes that the compiled program is what actually gets executed out in the real world. And that is what we are going to be looking at next. And this is the output that we see on the uh, terminal. Now a new command that we're going to be using to uh, actually examine what's inside these compiled binaries is uh, this thing known as object dump. So basically uh, everything you see here is sort of represented in hex. And this is the uh, actual binary file of the program that we just executed a few moments ago. So I'm going to step through what this sort of means and uh, hopefully try and make sense of what you're looking at. This left column consists of memory addresses and these are represented in hex. And this is basically where bits of machine language instructions are stored. Now a good analogy uh, for how memory works is basically think of a row of houses on a street. Now each house has an address, right? So within each address or within each house you have people inside them or things or whatever. And in this case we have instructions which are stored in each address so that the CPU knows what to execute. In the middle row, we have the instructions also in hex bytes. Now on the right side, you can see a list of instructions. And these are basically instructions in assembly language so that the processor can understand what's happening. Now these instructions don't even resemble what we saw in the C program earlier. So what we are seeing on the right side here is basically the representation of the C code we looked at earlier. It's just that the CPU won't be able to understand print or puts. It doesn't really understand the sort of higher level C language. It needs something in, in more understandable words. So there are a lot of instructions here. And basically all of these instructions put together compile the C program that we were looking at earlier. And yes, it is quite confusing because none of this looks like any of the code that we were looking at in the C program. So there's actually a really good analogy that uh, John uses to explain this and sort of make more sense of this. So if you look at all the books in the world, the millions and millions of books that exist today, basically all of these books can tell stories just through using 26 letters. It's the combination of each letter which combine and create something that's infinitely more complex, at least in the English language anyway. So just by using 26 letters, you can make an infinite number of possible combinations with so much complexity. And it's the same thing that's sort of happening here. A lot of these sort of simple low level instructions combine to make sort of very complex programs and eventually the C program that we were talking about. So we're going to introduce a uh, new command now. It is known as GDB, which is a debugging tool used to step through the compiled programs themselves and examine program memory and view processor registers. So if we run the GDB command on our earlier piece of code, which is written in C, and if we add a breakpoint in main before it runs, we can sort of see that this is the current state of program memory. And we are looking at the processor registers here at the moment, as well as a number of flags. So yeah, so basically we've just sort of set a breakpoint after main executes. So what we're looking at here is before we have printed out hello world 10 times. So on this top left hand side section, we are basically looking at a bunch of registers. So the first four registers are actually known as general purpose registers. The second four registers are also general purpose registers but they're also sometimes known as pointers and indexes. There are a few special registers here. So the EIP is the instruction pointer. So basically it points the current instruction, which the CPU is executing at that time. And everything below that are a bunch of flags with values that change as the program runs. And these are basically needed for the operations to work properly. And those operations are the machine language instructions we looked at earlier. So that's it. We are at page 24 at the moment. That's sort of my understanding and my notes that I took 
as I was reading through this textbook. So basically we sort of started off looking at the origins of hacking, the history of hacking. Then we sort of looked at what is programming itself, what's pseudocode. We ran through a bunch of control structures, which is quite basic and elementary. We then looked at a very basic C program, which prints hello world out 10 times. Then we used a command known as object dump. We basically looked inside the compiled binary file of this program. It was actually quite interesting to see just how different it looked to the C program. And then finally, we just sort of had an introduction to GDB, which allows us to stop the program while it's running and have a look at the internal memory structure, uh, look at registers as well. So yeah, we are up to page 24 and the next podcast will kick off from this point. I assume we're going to be looking in more detail uh, into the inner workings of program memory as well as the registers involved.